Welcome, Brittany. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. Um, I am embarrassed to say that I did not know about your book until it won the Amazon number one book of the year. And I don't know how that's possible. And I must be like under a rock and I try to be on top of all the great books. But until then, I hadn't even heard about your book. And I am so glad I did because it is so good. Um, Thank you. Knock at midnight. Oh my gosh. Um, Amazing. So I have like a bazillion questions for you, but first I just have to say, I am so impressed by you, by not just your writing, but everything that happened in this book, your work ethic, your determination, um, how hard, it, you're just amazing. You're like a total rock star. And I'm like, uh, excited <laughs> to talk to you today. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Oh my Truly. gosh. Um, okay. So for listeners who might not know what your book is about, would you mind telling them a little bit about the backstory and how it's led to your becoming the advocate you are today for so many people? Yeah, I grew up in rural East Texas. One of those doors unlocked, windows wide open, <laughs> pieces of rural Texas and truly had a happy childhood. Unfortunately, during my childhood, my mom was also suffering with a drug addiction and her addiction ultimately led to her going to prison and having a mom in prison, it really brought me close and made me very conscious of this issue of mass incarceration that our country faces. And so during this time and being so close, I got really interested in the criminal legal system began representing people who were fundamentally set to die in prison under these outdated federal drug laws. And so the book follows that journey. It follows my journey growing up in rural East Texas. It, it follows the events surrounding my mother's incarceration and that experience of having a mom in prison. And yeah, the book is truly a memoir that shows how I came to understand injustice in the courts, how I discovered genius behind bars, and just how this journey caused my definition of freedom to evolve. Wow. How did you remember all of this? First of all, this is such a minor point, but the detail in your book is so great. Did you record everything as you went along? Like how did, how are you able, because the way you wrote it, it was like we were literally like standing on your shoulder watching everything you went through, right? From the time you were little to when you then, you know, even show us into Sharonda's family and her mother and the being, the accident. I mean, like every detail is so vivid. In fact, when I went on your Instagram, and saw a picture of your mom and then your mom, Alina, I was like, oh yeah, totally. That's totally what they look like. Yeah. That's exactly how you describe them. Um, yeah, you know, it was a long journey for me to write that book. It took me over two years to write the book and I was just very intentional with every piece of it from every word to every punctuation mark, you know? And so with each section, I, just became very intimate with it. I made sure that I went back into time in that way. And that really helped, you know, once you're there and present and conscious about a particular moment, it's very surprising on how much memory does come back. So did you have any, I mean, I know you didn't, but I was going to ask if you had any idea about the injustices of all the drug laws, because I definitely did not realize all of the, um, how unfair and even though you know a hundred to one sentencing for the difference between like crack cocaine and cocaine and when you are doing um when you're part of uh conspiracy versus if you're not and how biased it was towards black people and it's just insane i couldn't believe all the data that you discovered and as you like show the reader you seemed really surprised by a lot of it too tell me about that Oh yeah, I had no idea. So I am in law school and truly wanting to be a corporate lawyer. I was gonna follow my path for that. I had a job lined up after law school in corporate law. And so during this time, I took a critical race theory course. 
And it's a course that analyzes the intersection between race and the law. And I was writing my paper about this disparity in sentencing you mentioned between powder cocaine and crack cocaine and how it was disproportionately impacting people of color, in particular Black people. And I was shocked by what I learned. I was shocked at how little to no legislative history was there surrounding this law, which was the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act. I was shocked at how arbitrary the disparity in sentencing was with this 100 to 1 ratio, which means that you could have 500 grams of powder cocaine, I could have only five grams of crack, and we would receive the same sentence in prison. And you know, it's not lost on anyone then, especially now that in the late 80s, more affluent white people were using powder cocaine and crack cocaine was running rampant through communities of color, in particular black communities. And this caused such a wide disparity in sentencing to the extent that even today, over 80% of the people in federal prison for drug offenses are black and brown people. And it was shocking to me as a law student to learn that, especially learning it based on just how unfounded these assumptions were that crack cocaine was more severe than powder. And what was also shocking to me was after the law passed, the sentencing commission and members of Congress and courts, they all began to see just how unjust these laws were. And so to see how the laws were put into place, to see this change of heart, if you will, surrounding the laws, but to know that people are still in prison serving these draconian sentences, it was quite eye-opening for me. And even as the laws started to change and you would get so excited, then you would realize that a lot of them weren't retroactive. So yeah. I feel like you were wringing your hands a lot of the time of like, how could you change it? And then finally you were able to figure out your path. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It was totally just the way it reads in the book, you know, trial and error <laughs> for sure. And, you know, even learning that like, oh, I'm getting so excited because I see how minds are evolving and this country is evolving as it relates to crack cocaine and I'm seeing the laws change and then I'm like oh well it, it's not retroactive oh another law change oh it's not retroactive either and so it was just unconscionable to me you know that we have people serving life sentences today under these outdated federal drug laws and you know, to me, and I would think to any reasonable person, if the law is wrong today, it was wrong yesterday. Right. And I saw, and now of course you've started all these different nonprofits to helping people escape from these sentences and overturn what had been going on before. Um, your um, Buried Alive project um, on the website, it said something like there were still three or 4,000 people 3,400 maybe, I don't know, I can't remember. Something like awful, like all these people and the laws have changed and they shouldn't have been in there and they shouldn't be serving life sentences. And yet there they are. And like, what can we do about it? And that's what, so tell me about how the nonprofit has built, that you've built up around it and how, how those people can get out. Yeah, I co-founded the Buried Alive Project with two of my clients, Sharonda Jones and Corey Jacobs. They were both sentenced to life for federal drug cases, both had never had any convictions before, felony or otherwise. And we were able to secure clemency for them from President Barack Obama. And once they were free, they felt a survivor's remorse, if you will, because they knew they had left so many people behind who were just as deserving of freedom as they were. And so I linked arms with my clients and we co-founded the Buried Alive Project to provide legal representation pro bono for people serving life for federal drug offenses. And you know, to date, we've helped free dozens of men and women who were set to die in prison, who are now living their life after life, as we like to call it. And you know, still there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more. And so we're doing what we can to build a super team of lawyers to help litigate these cases through the courts and also working on clemencies and working through Congress, quite frankly, to ensure that we have laws that are changed. 
What was that like? Like, what was, what's the feeling like when you've literally been able through your hard work and dedication, given someone their entire life back? Tell me about that moment. Oh, it never gets old. It is a feeling that, you know, words can't even begin to touch. It's such a joy and elation. People have to understand, you know, and remember that life without parole is the second most severe penalty permitted by law in America, other than the death penalty. And this sentence, it, it screams a person is beyond hope. It screams a person is beyond redemption. <laughs> And it truly suffocates mass potential as it buries people alive. And to know that my clients, people like Sharonda Jones and Corey Jacobs and Chris Young, who you read about in the book, are said to die in prison, they're literally serving the same amount of time as the Unabomber. It's heartbreaking for me. And so to be able to tell them that we've given that life sentence back, as we like to say, and they are free. Yeah, I get chills just thinking about it, you know. You are an angel. I mean, truly, that this is your become your life's work and that you're so smart and dedicated that you can do it. It's amazing. Like it's Thank just you. amazing. And it's amazing to watch from the outside and to have read about it and um, you know. Even when like your name was in my inbox, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like because I feel like you're like um, you're just such a hero. It's it's uh, it's truly amazing, um, and I feel like it would be so great if so if other people would follow in your footsteps, right? Other people who have your brains and your potential, who could work towards helping people get their lives back. Versus, you know, I know in the beginning you wanted to be like Claire Huxtable and you know, be a big corporate lawyer and, you know, you were and everything, but um, wow, the value you've added to society by having all these people come back and people's lives and even reducing the sentence for your one family friend um, when you were like, well, like, I got him from life to something like 32 years, like, yeah. and, and how they were all like celebrating. I mean, it's a huge, it's just such a huge deal. I mean, I, this sounds so obvious, but I don't know. I'm just heaping praise. Which is oh, cool. thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. I appreciate it so much. And, you know, it's an honor and a true privilege for me to do this work. I am grateful to my clients for trusting me with their lives, literally trusting me with their lives. And it's a task that I, I don't take lightly. And I always say I fight for my clients' lives as if it were my own, because it is. You know, we are all one. And what impacts one directly impacts us all indirectly. And there is so much untapped genius in this population of people, people who are incarcerated, who are formerly incarcerated. And I've seen it firsthand and, and it's true ingenuity our nation needs to thrive. And so the human potential there keeps me going. My clients' prayers and strength and empowerment keeps me going. And yeah, I agree with you. I truly hope that more people, you know, join us to help push and drive for impactful change. Um, and tell me about Jem and Milena Rain and 16 Cap 16 and 16 Cap, all these, like, how are you running four different nonprofits at the same time? Like, this is insane. How are you sleeping? When, when well, are you doing everything? Yeah, well, only two of them are, are nonprofits, you know. Okay, I, sorry, I, businesses. businesses. Yeah, they're business. Sorry. Yeah, we, I totally believe we can't nonprofit ourselves to a better and just society. But I do have two nonprofits, Buried Alive Project and Girls Embracing Mothers. And Girls Embracing Mothers is a nonprofit that empowers young girls with mothers in prison. We partner with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and every single month take a group of girls to visit their moms in prison. And we're truly working to break the cycle and build a bond. And that organization is so near and dear to my heart. It stems solely from my own experience of having a mother in prison. And we've been operating for seven years now I have amazing teams. That's one of the reasons I'm able to, to carry it all. Our program, Girls Embracing Mothers, our program director, Angelica, she was formerly incarcerated. In fact, her and her daughter were in our program just a few years ago. And that's so important to me. 
that directly impacted people are centered, they're amplified, and you know they're leading the way on any movement and any work surrounding them. And so linking arms with Sharonda and Corey with the Buried Alive Project and having Angelica lead Girls Embracing Mothers is, is truly my life's work to ensure that they are at the table for sure. And Melina Rain is a company named after my grandma, Lena. And it's there, I just wanna cultivate talent from the South, help writers from the South, showcase their talents, break through to get opportunity. And 16 Capital Partners is similar. I'm working with that company to bridge the gap, to provide resources and capital to formerly incarcerated entrepreneurs. You know, one thing I realized doing the work and writing the book really helped me reflect on this is we have to change the laws. We have to continue our work to get people out of prison. But I realized also that we can't keep rescuing people from prison and restoring them to poverty. And I'm holding this vision of creating sustainable liberation, you know, which includes economic liberation, it includes equity, it includes ensuring that directly impacted people have access to resources and capital, not just so they can survive, but so they can thrive and flourish, you know, and that's what I'm working with 16 Capital Partners. We've invested in a couple of companies so far that are ran by formerly incarcerated people, including Sharonda Jones, who is recently in the process of opening a food truck. And she'll hire directly impacted people, you know, to work in her food truck. And so it's just about paying it forward and, you know, realizing too that systemic change doesn't always have to come from Capitol Hill. We need the laws to change for sure, but the people that we are freeing, they're pushing forward a movement of such power and dignity that they're going to create systemic change and they're going to have a positive impact on anyone that they encounter in the future. And it all just keeps me so hopeful. That's amazing. Um, so how has your life changed, if at all, since this book came out and your story became a much more widely known phenomenon? Well, it's been amazing. I'm truly grateful at just the public's reception of the book. I'm so thankful to Amazon editors for choosing my book as the best book of 2020. Never in a million years did this small town country girl think that, that this would be the case, but it's been great. It's really helped to elevate what's important for me. And that's this issue of mass incarceration and help raise awareness for causes I'm very passionate about. And that, you know, that's always a win. Do you find any time for yourself where you're not like working? Do you have any time when you're not emailing or doing stuff or fighting or I don't know. I feel like even when you would talk about going to work and then you'd come home and then you'd have these like buckets of cases and files and transcripts. And I'm like, did she get, did she get dinner? Like when is this girl eating? <laughs> well, I would eat and work. You know, I do. It is something that I'm working to center the self-care practice and, you know, self-care taking it back to its radical roots, right? Like not self-care is this form of escapism, but self-care in order to rest so that I can be fully restored to continue the work. You know, the amazing poet Audre Lorde says, you know, self-care isn't an act of indul self-indulgence, it's an act of self-preservation, you know, and it's an act of radical act and that's what I try to try to practice and I'm practicing which means I'm getting better I'm not all the way there yet but I definitely try to work to, to take that time to to focus on me um is this going to be a movie has this been optioned it must have been well you know we're in a lot of talks so <laughs> hopefully there's some news I can share soon okay I bet I can't wait to watch it I mean I feel like I watched it because I read it it's so cinematic the whole thing oh it's, thank you such a visual writer um like everything is just so clear and um oh my gosh how is I want to like follow up on all the characters like what's up with your sister how's she doing ah, is she my good sister, yeah jazz she's doing amazing she's actually in law enforcement now and yeah she's doing really well I'm so proud of her Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, 
tell me a little bit about like what is next you have so many projects so many good deeds you're doing do you want to write anymore do you want to just soldier on with your all of your you know mission driven activities like what is what is your next five years look like for you I mean you know I won't rule out writing another book I definitely won't rule that out definitely gonna keep moving forward with what I'm calling this liberation heist getting people out of prison, making sure we're serving women and girls who are directly impacted as well. You know, and then I'm going to continue the work to ensure that resources and capital are allocated to formerly incarcerated people and and justice impacted people, for sure. So do you have any ambition to run for office? I don't. Okay. I don't. You say it, like, you say it in, in like a, it's no failure. I'm just asking, you know. You never yeah, know. no, I don't. It's not my thing. I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> um, so back to the writing for two seconds. Um, you said it took two years, which you said was a long time, which PS is not a long time for a book. <laughs> all the things I've heard um like where and when did you write this like when did you fit this into life and then do you have any advice to aspiring authors yes well I'll first start with my advice to aspiring authors and that's to do it share your story the world needs your story no one can tell your story or any fictional story you're dreaming up better than you and the world needs it. You know, that is motivation that I received from people and I wanna definitely pass that along. I found time in between the work, honestly. I had hoped to set aside a period of time to just focus solely on the book, but you know, freedom calls. And as my shirt says, there's nothing more urgent than freedom. And so I was still able to set aside blocks of time to write and blocks of time to work. And for me, it was a process that was in a way therapeutic as I talked so much about my childhood experiences and and having a mother who was incarcerated. So I had to really be gentle with myself during the writing of, of that. And also ensuring that whatever time I set aside, that I was solely focused on the work, especially related to my client stories. I was so intentional there and I wanted to really show their heartbeats on the page in hopes that their lives and stories could impact the reader on the page the way it impacted me in real life. And I knew, you know, because we're dealing with such a vulnerable population and mass incarceration still has all these stigmas and stereotypes that you know, one word, if I chose one wrong word, you know, it could help perpetuate these stigmas and and biases. And so I was really intentional with my client's stories. I really held them close to heart. And I'm just so hopeful that people see their brilliance and, and genius and just truly how amazing, amazing they are. And, you know, I say all the time, you know, many, many people in prison, they're not bad people, they just made bad choices. And we all make bad choices every day. And really having a chance at redemption is is something truly powerful. Wow. Amazing. We didn't even get to like the abuse. I mean, there's like so much in this book. This is, (laughs) um, and I see all these books behind you by all these amazing authors. So I'm love to read as well I see I love to read um, I love to read you got the actually you have I behind your shoulder I'm seeing both Obama books um not yes to, yes there we go <laughs> um tell me about read so what are you just read everything or what's your favorite kind of book to read you know I read everything I really am hooked on reading books by black authors from the south as you see, uh, Jasmine Ward behind me, KSA Layman behind me with Heavy, Sarah Broom, <laughs> The Yellow House. Uh, I recently read Britt Bennett, The Vanishing Half. She's from that the South so as good. well. <laughs> it's so good. And I, I had, had, been I had her on this podcast. You should listen. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I would love to meet her one day. <laughs> I've been reading so many memoirs and nonfiction and, and to dive into her book that's fiction. Oh, my God. 
It was so good. And then, you know, I mix it with other books. Like I'm reading a book on the business of venture capital right now, you know, as I'm trying to break into that space to create access for, for directly impacted people. So it's, it's all a mix, but I've definitely been finding myself draw more to fiction lately. Well, that's a great example of amazing fiction. And I feel like your book and her book were two of the best of this whole year. So oh, thank you. Yeah, you should definitely, you know, if you ever need a moderator, I'm happy to moderate that conversation. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> that would be amazing. Life, I would have you, like, you know, I'd invite, invite you over and have like a salon anyway. Uh, oh, that would be beautiful. <laughs> and I also, I have a book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club. So if you have any interest, I would love to have my whole book club read your book and then you come talk and like do some Q&A for half an hour. I don't know if you'd be- interested. I would love to. Let's oh. do it. Let's do it. Okay, Let's great. I'm going to email you about times in, in the new year. So Okay. Awesome. Well, Brittany, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do for people in the world and all you do to uplift others and um, open everybody's eyes to the injustices that are there and do it in such a classy way. It's just really awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. It's been a pleasure to start my day off and <laughs> you are a gem. A true oh, deal. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll stay in touch. Book club coming up. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.